All right, let's talk about Halo. Let's talk about E3 2015. Let's talk about the reactions that we have seen regarding the gameplay reveal and uh, possibly some of the misconceptions that some people might have, and hopefully I can help clear that up. Uh, well, this is not really a defense of it because there are some things about this that I didn't like as well, so I'll be sure to be somewhat impartial in the way that I'm going to be talking about all this. So Halo 5. Halo 5 Guardians, and basically, the gameplay reveal was pretty much what I expected. What I expected in regards to the fact that it was pretty much all the information that we knew up to this point brought into a gameplay video. You know, with the Game Informer article that came out before, we have received a large amount of information regarding... All the gameplay mechanics that were going to be in it, the fact that it was going to be a squad base, the fact that you were going to be able to order people around, that Locke has the tracking device, and the fact that uh, there's going to be a lot more chattiness between the protagonists and the secondary characters around them. But people seem to be the most upset about the fact that it seems, oh, Call of Duty-ish. And that's what I think I'm going to get out of the way first before I talk about anything else. Halo games have traditionally been very scripted. Whenever you see them at, at E3, I think that the only one I believe wasn't all that scripted was the very first Halo game, all the way back when it was first revealed. And even then, it wasn't 100% representative of the final game. So let's talk about Halo 5. And the fact that when we first saw Locke's team on the uh, Covenant planet... Uh, I, I, Senoya, I believe that was the name of it off the top of my head. Some people have uh, stated that it, it appeared too much like Call of Duty and the fact that as you were going, there were times where you were a, interrupted by a small scene of uh, crossing a crumbling bridge where uh, at one point you lose control of your player so that they stumble, that Locke stumbles and almost falls into the ocean but is able to right himself. It's worth noting that in this uh, this little scene, there's no prompt for a quick time event. He automatically gets up and jumps back over. And people were somewhat upset in the fact that everything seemed relatively staged. And that, oh, there's an enemy that comes at this correct time and they're, they're ordered to take that down. Or that at the very end of the gameplay where you meet who I believe is actually the villain of the game, the Warden of the Domain. And uh, I suppose what I should get out of the way is this seems like it was specifically put together. This was specifically made simply to show off all the new elements. It was exactly what I expected. I expected them to show off all the stuff that we knew before just in video form. And that wasn't to say that it was probably done in the best way they could have done it. And that, yes, it did seem like it was scripted because it was done so that way. If people remember in Halo 4, it was exactly the same way, where the level that they showed was somewhat different than what we saw in the end. In the fact that the speech was different, the enemy encounters were different, and animations were not the same ones that we saw there before. You might argue that, oh, well, Halo turned out to be different than what we expected anyway, but what I'm trying to say is, what you see as a trailer does not represent the final release of a game. Like people, I don't know if people remember this, but Halo 2's E3 was absolutely nothing like what we got in, in the end. Remember this? No, no, behind that ST. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three more, coming left. I'm running low, man. Oh yeah, Parsons. Yeah? Is it clear? You tell me! Friend is moving out! Covering fire! Gonna ask for reinforcements. I didn't think they'd send a Spartan. We gotta take that thing out. Cover me! Tech HQ, this is Sergeant Banks. I've got hostile artillery 200 meters north northeast of my position. Three, smoke, over. Damn it, HQ! 
You remember all of this? to get that nothing remotely almost nothing because dual wielding and hijacking was all there but n n very little of this remained in the final release and i was actually so disappointed knowing that 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 sort of thing that sort of combat that sort of world battle that we saw in the halo 2e3 2005 trailer wasn't there or was it 2004 i don't care fact what i'm saying is wait until you actually see the actual game this i can't judge this not really but i'll try to see if i can give my thoughts on it as best i can in fact what i'm trying to say is i'm not going to be able to judge it until i actually see the real level or the real thing so as i was saying before the way that the characters all talk about another is great, especially like hearing Nathan Fillion speak, because he's probably one of the best voice actors out of all of them. He just has good emotion as the character, and he gets right into Eddie Buck, which is fantastic. The audio has been reworked. You can actually tell that, especially from when the um, the incapacitated elite is given a nice three-shot burst to the head. You can actually hear the difference, and that was specifically done for two reasons. First of all was to show the fact that the Covenant is speaking English again, and the fact that you can hear the redone audio. And it, I don't actually don't even remember if uh, if he even fired the battle rifle anytime after that. Oh well, that's not important. But the audio has changed. The fact that the aliens are speaking English again, ex especially the fact the grunts are. And are somewhat humorous now, which sort of now contrasts the kind of dark atmosphere that we're seeing with Halo 5, but I'm still happy to hear it nonetheless. I'm happy to see that the Prometheans also got a bit of a redesign. They are somewhat better than the Beetle design that we saw in Halo 4. And they speak English as well, which is somewhat interesting. I guess uh, if you could explain it story-wise... Maybe they were able to crack uh, Forerunner language. I know that there were several people that were working on that in the Halo universe, so it's perfectly feasible to um, to think that, that they perhaps got that, that uh, linguistic protocol down. This new main villain, the Warden of the Domain, the Guardian Eternal or something like that, the person who's actively controlling the Guardians, if he's a person at all, he could be an AI. But I hazard to guess that he may have been ancient human, given the fact that we know the origins of the Prometheans in Halo 4. And the fact that when he is uh, when he's attacking Locke at the end of the trailer, he seems to have that standard Promethean look. The fact that he has a skull-like face. Now, I'm very, very positive that something like this will not be in the final game. It's possible you might be encountering this guy way earlier, or it's possible you might be encountering him later. 
But the fact of the matter is 343 has basically shown us our enemy. This is the guy that you're going to be fighting against, or he is one of the principal protagonists. I have a funny feeling that Jewel and Dama isn't going to be a, um, a major player in this one, even though that's basically the reason that you're in the, the demo level in the first place is to take down what's left of Jewel and Dama's Covenant. We know that we're on the Arbiter's side because of the speech that Locke basically says to him. And he says that, well, of course, that the Arbiter has been working for this for a while. And given the implications of some of Buck's lines in the trailer, like when all, when all the soldiers hear about this, they'll never forgive us or something like that, it seems that Locke's team is in on something. Or not in the standard Oni sort of thing, because it, it's interesting to see that Oni's reach here especially going into Halo 5 in regards to the closing of Hunt the Truth, in which they kind of won in the end. I mean, if I can just branch off from that, those guys played the long game. <laughs> they went out of their way. I was actually quite shocked to hear that it was basically just all, all a ruse, which is perfectly, which is genius, I think. Especially me thinking that Pharaoh herself was actually a part of some actual resistance movement. In the end, she was just an Oni plant, as was everyone. And the fact that Ben probably ended up in a short grave on some nameless rock somewhere. Great. Fantastic. But I want to know what their connection is to the Guardians. Because I'm in firm belief that Oni knew about the Guardians or was trying to formulate ways to stop them or at least address them. They knew what it was. According to the gameplay trailers, Locke's team knew what a Guardian was. How did they know what a Guardian was? Because if I remember correctly, in the Game Informer article, they were saying that the first level was on Bliss, I believe. It's implied. I believe that's what it is. Second level was on an Oni research station, where you were playing as Blue Team. Which means that... The level that we saw with Locke is possibly the third level or so. So there's two levels of stuff that we haven't seen. And people saying that it's very closed, very not co uh, very COD-like, it directly conflicts with the information that we have received from Game Informer, stating that there were large rooms to battle in. And Green Skulls uh, from Ready Up Lives, his own personal experience, says that there was a crashing through walls making your own routes and routes, routes and fighting in huge environments, especially like the one that was said to be hundreds of feet tall or something like that, or like 100 feet tall, I don't remember exactly what it was. But in that Oni research station where you weren't bound by corridors, this conflicts. Now some might be saying, oh, he was lying. If he lied, and we can see gameplay of this, what purpose would that serve? I don't believe it. Bottom line about the campaign is it was what I expected. I, but And because I expected it, I wasn't necessarily blown away by it because I already knew it was kind of coming. I wish they went in the direction of a more open-ended thing, but these guys were pressed for time. I could tell from the fact that they started later than expected because according to the E3 schedule, they were supposed to start at 12, 12 Eastern. But they didn't start until close to half past that, so they had less time. I believe they rushed things too. We also know that 343 is having a panel on Wednesday so that they can personally discuss the game a bit more and can possibly show us more footage of it, which I'm very much looking forward to. Unfortunately, I'm going to be, um, I'm busy that day. I have graduation that day, so I'm not going to be able to look at that straight away, but immediately after I'm done with that, I can take a good look at it. But they're going to clear stuff up. And Frank O'Connor himself from NeoGAF which is one of the places that he posts under, stated that that level, that part of the level was specifically chosen simply to show off all the new gameplay elements. You want to say that it's linear? Fine. Fantastic. Do so. I don't buy it. I believe it was specifically shortened just to show off all the new abilities. So, let's talk about Warzone. Now, this idea goes back. Back to Bungie's time because... They were stating that they were going to be doing stuff like this since Halo 3. Since Halo 2, because we have seen war like large-scale battles back in the Halo 2 E3 uh, trailer, 
where we saw stuff like long swords all over the place, artillery pieces going off, the whole city was on fire. We didn't see that in the end. They said that they were thinking of looking at that for Halo 3. Didn't see that. We know that they were testing it for Reach. Didn't see that in the end. And now we're actually seeing in Halo 5, we're seeing a form of a world battle in the form of Warzone. 12v12 v everyone else. Now it looks like there's two teams that are going off against each other plus an environment in a sort of a hybridization between invasion and firefight. Both teams are looking to get to a thousand points, so they take on their environment to do so. You'll have Covenant and Prometheans to deal with, as well as bosses that'll come by every now and again. You can apparently level up and gain new abilities and all that. Loadouts are back for this game mode. Why am I not angry about all that? Because it was specifically done to show off, well, not to show off, to include every aspect of the sandbox. For a huge battle like this, where one of your primary concerns is taking on the environment, I'm not too concerned about loadouts. I expect it, actually, for something like that, because we have a whole bunch of vehicles, a whole bunch of weapons, a whole bunch of abilities, um... And it makes me wonder if the Pelicans are going to be flyable. I know that in the trailer, we saw them flying around, and but I, I'm not too sure other than that. So, there's a hypothesis that perhaps, my guess is that there are going to be around three of these, in, uh, three of these Warzone maps. And I know of two. The first of which is one that we have seen in the trailers. And this one kind of blows my mind because... <laughs> Okay, let me set this uh, let me set the scene for you here. This map, you are fighting in the middle of the ocean. A section of the ocean has been blocked off by force fields, meaning that you are actually fighting on the exposed seafloor, whereupon a human uh, a human research center or something like that has been constructed within this shielded off area. So you have hundred foot high walls of water surrounding the map in the middle of which there is a space shuttle launch pad or something like that waiting to take off. How the hell did they think of this? I certainly wouldn't have, especially thinking, for what purpose was this place constructed? And I figure that there's some good lore behind it as well, but seriously, <laughs> you're fighting like in the middle of the Red Sea after Moses just, just got done with it or something like that. That's the best way that I can explain this. And I like this concept. Based on what I've seen, is it also takes aspects of territories too, and energy units, where apparently as you earn things, as you take on your environment, you earn energy units, and these are what you use to purchase weapons. Weapons and perhaps vehicles, according to the, the post I've seen made by Frank O'Connor. That's really cool. I am legitimately looking forward to that because I know from personal experience my experience in the December beta, that we're not going to be seeing any of that in the multiplayer. That's going to be limited to itself. And given from what I've heard, Big Team Battle is still going to be there too. Which is great, knowing that there's going to be something for everyone. And I think for a long time, a lot of Halo fans wanted something like this. Big, huge battles where you can take everything and use it to your advantage. I stated that there was a second one. This one is not too obvious. It's actually during the trailers where you can see fighting on Sanghelios. And the reason I say this is because there appears to be multiple Spartans in the area, not to mention multiple Mantises. Manti? I don't, I don't know. If, if you take a look again, you'll see what I'm talking about uh, in regards to a giant boss or a giant walker of some sort, which I assume these are what these mini-bosses are. And that makes me really excited because there is some really good objective play in there as well. And everyone can do something. You want to take on the objective, fine. You want to take on the enemies, fine. You won't, won't earn as much XP to unlock all that stuff, which is okay. It's okay with me. It really is. And our multiplayer, so far as I know, isn't all that different. And uh, if you see my last video regarding Halo 5, 
it, you know from the fact that they changed the uh, DMR scope. They've also changed the sniper rifle scope as well, which is very good because it's less obstructive that way. I wonder if the uh, I wonder if the battle rifle changed at all. Now there was also that weapon that covenant grenade launcher called a plasma caster, which seems to have two modes of firing. The first is single fire, which is really uh, something of a brute shot, I believe, where the projectiles bounce and go around and stick on people, and they can do explosions. Secondary fire itself is much more like the uh, plasma launcher from Halo Reach, where you can charge up, charge up a secondary fire, and then let it go. All of those shots combined into one can stick to enemies and detonate, which I assume would lead to a quick death. Now, I'm not too sure if these sort of uh, shots track people like the plasma launcher did. I hazard to guess it won't, but it's really good for anti-personnel as well as anti-vehicle. I would love to see if someone could replay that section differently where Locke was the one to, back in the campaign, where Locke would be the one to take a look at the assault rifle, or if someone else would have done all that stuff, the dialogue would be different. If it did, that shows that you can play it however you want, and would sort of throw off some of that scripted sort of element. Would be nice to see if you can trade with your teammates. Should be interesting. Now, what some people might not know about that squad-based combat as well is that your teammates will run out of ammo on their own and will eventually have to scrounge their own uh, stuff around the battlefield. That's good. So 20 minutes. I basically talked about that whole thing. Halo 5 is fine. It's fine. I'm not too excited because I already knew what I was getting into. I just saw some footage, and I'm happy with it. I'm satisfied with it. I want to see some more. I want to see some actual user experience with Warzone. And uh, we're going to be getting that uh, when the floor opens up tomorrow as well as when 343 can explain more stuff during their panel. It's fine. I'm not um, I'm not too excited. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazingly excited with backwards compatibility, especially since that was something on everyone's mind. I haven't seen the Sony conference. I don't even know if the Sony conference has uh, been on yet. I'll just have to look at the, um, see if they had that taken care of uh, with backwards compatibility. But that's great for me because they have plenty of Xbox 360 games I can still keep. I don't have to throw them out at all. I can get rid of this freaking Xbox 360. It would look half dead with faceplate missing and stuff like that. Plus, it's loud as all hell. It's terrible to record with. <laughs> but man, that Fallout. <laughs> that Fallout 4. That first day, I, my jaw successively hit the floor at least three, four, five times with each and every announcement they made. What were they thinking? I mean, in the best possible way, Jesus, Murphy, I'm going to shift gears from Halo for a little bit, but that Fallout 4, them weapons, we K now. If any of you get that joke at all, all glory to the Murder Cube. This is Fallout 4 Murder Cube Edition, where you can even customize your baseball bats with whatever you want to do. It just works. It just works. It's basically like they turned the game into rust, but made it even better. And especially awesome, since the Xbox One version will get mod support from the PC, so you can transfer mods from the PC over to the console. I've actually never heard of that before. I think it's the, the first game I've ever heard of for a console, which will allow mod support. It's great. I don't see why more people aren't excited. And I'm even more excited to hear that Elite Dangerous is going to be part of the early access program that they have for the Xbox One now. And I'll be able to try it out. I've been thinking about buying Elite Dangerous, but now that I actually have a chance to check it out on the Xbox One, I might buy it for the PC, though, in the end. Because uh, it's uh, it's basically what it is. I want to see if it's 60 frames per second. It probably won't be on the Xbox One, which is why I'll probably go for the PC in the end. But I'm just... Happy that I have the opportunity right now. Oh, the PC players are mad as all hell right now. They are not happy with this. And it kind of amuses me, even though I'm going to be picking it up for the computer afterwards. Steam Summer Sale? It's okay. Bought one or two little things. Nothing that really grabs my eye. I've only bought, like, small stuff. Like, uh, I bought Far Cry. I bought uh, Unreal Tournament 2004. So I'm getting my arena fix as well as some smaller other stuff. That's fine. That's okay. Halo, it's what you get, right? 
I want to see some more gameplay footage, but I know they're going to be sending that to us. Thanks very much for sticking through with this, and I'll see you in the next video.